have Judith Fingard with us. Judith is a retired history professor and a former president of the Royal Nova Scotia Historical Society, the first woman to occupy the chair. As well as a fellow of the Royal Nova Scotia Society, Historical Society, and of the Royal Society of Canada. She published a number of papers in the 1980s and 90s relating to the emergence of the Black middle class in Halifax. Many of us will remember those papers. This presentation this evening covers some of the same ground, but emphasizes the opportunities for young women to improve their life chances in the face of the significant obstacles they encountered in the city. And Judith's presentation is titled, Two Girls Named Blanche, Race, Gender, and Education in Turn of the 20th Century Halifax. She is going to be exploring the entrance of the city's Black community into opportunities offered by local institutions, cultural institutions, such as the Halifax Academy and the Conservatory of Music. Judith, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lois. And hello and greetings to friends, old friends, and new friends. Firstly, I want to acknowledge that we are located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Also, I live in Halifax's Old North End, where in the late 19th and early 20th century, featured in this paper, descendants of American and British West Indian slaves on this side of the Atlantic and refugees fleeing from anti-Semitism on the other side of the Atlantic lived, worked, and went to school. As the Historical Society's notice indicates, my starting point for this talk is an item in the first issue in April 1915 of the short-lived Atlantic Advocate. The paper was produced by leading Black citizens in Halifax, mainly from the British West Indies, and devoted to the interests of colored people, this being the term they preferred to use at the time. My interest that builds on work I did 30 plus years ago centers on the two lives, sorry, centers on the lives of two women named Blanche. The Atlantic Advocate identifies Blanche Roach as the first colored young lady to enter the Conservatory of Music and by that, by a sing singular coincidence, Miss Roach's mother was the first colored lady to enter the Halifax Academy, the city's public non-sectarian high school. This presentation about the two Blanches involves three approaches. The first is genealogical, the second is biographical, and the third is thematic. And I hope you can see that on your screen. So, um, let's start with the family tree and what that tells us. Here the focus is on one origins, two religion, and three American connections. First origins, the newspaper sources indicate that Margaret Grandison, she's in the, on the right side at the, the bottom, Margaret, um, who married William Grandison, the maternal grandmother of George Roach, the husband of the first Blanche and the father of the second, 
was brought to Nova Scotia from Baltimore as a young child at the end of the War of 1812. Other experiences center on Nova Scotian rural or semi-rural backgrounds. The maternal grandparents of the elder Blanche, um, James and um, Sarah Bell, were residents of East Preston. Josephine Weber, a significant family member for the younger Blanche as a compatible stepmother, hailed from Hansport. Another feature of origins that we might expect to find in an extended Black family in the late 19th century is marriage of local women to British West Indians, themselves descended from slaves, who visited as seafarers and then settled in Nova Scotia, either as seafarers or in other jobs. James Martin, And Antiguan was one of these men. He was the second husband of Adelaide Roach, the mother of the above mentioned George. Martin is important because of his influence on George's career. Like many black seafarers, he was a shipboard cook, sometimes steward. And as a young man, George followed his stepfather into this calling before making the transition to opening a restaurant and a catering business on shore. A second feature of the family tree relates to religion. In the mid and late 19th century, most black residents of Halifax became members either of the African Baptist Church or the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Over time, many had experience as members of one and then the other. The other African Nova Scotians tended to be Anglican, a church which continued to serve black members throughout the pre-First World War era. For example, the above mentioned Bells of East Preston um, they um, were affiliated with the Church of England in 1871, which may be explained by James's reported origins as an Englishman. But before 1906, when the widowed Sarah Bell died in a daughter's house in the North End, so it's in Halifax's North End, she was well within the fold of the local African Baptist Church. And another example, when George Roach married his second wife, Josephine, in 1905, it was in Trinity Anglican Church. Alas, no longer with us. Josephine continued for some years to identify as Anglican, and in the 1911 census entry on the Roach family, Blanche Jr. too was listed as Anglican. The occasional Anglican affiliation is not surprising given the prominence of that church both in Nova Scotia and in the British colonies in the Caribbean. But other Protestant churches play a role from time to time. If we turn our attention to marriages, we find quite a few performed by pastors of North End churches not usually associated with Black residents. Convenience was clearly a, one strategy for African Nova Scotians. Black churches were frequently without pastors for months on end, during which nuptials and funerals were needed. Uh, Blanche Sr.'s um, parents, Henry and um, Emmeline, um, hem, em, sorry, Henry Russell and Emmeline Bell. Oops. No good. Um, they were married um, in 1866 by the minister of the North Baptist Church located on Goddington Street between Falkland and Cornwallis. The union of the Blanche of Blanche's future mother-in-law, widow Adelaide Grandison um, Roach, um, with her second husband, James Martin, 
1867 was solemnized by the pastor of Poplar Grove Presbyterian Church, which was then on one of our now lost streets, Star Street. Blanche's, Blanche Jr.'s future in-laws, James and, and Florence Maud Davis, were joined in marriage in 1868 by the incumbent of Brunswick Street Methodist Church. This is the Brunswick Street Methodist Church in a, in a slightly earlier iteration than you see these days. The third genealogical feature relates to continuing links between people of Nova Scotia and Americans, especially New Englanders. We know that Nova Scotians traditionally had strong ties to New England and the practice of regular visiting was a significant one. We also know that the oat migration so prevalent in Nova Scotia and the rest of the region in the late 19th century was often to New England, at least initially. And so it is not surprising to find this characteristic in the lives of Black Nova Scotians. A number of people in the two Blanches extended family fall into this category, but it also relates specifically to the two Blanches themselves in very personal ways. The first Blanche was sent to Cambridge, Massachusetts to attend school in 1882-83 and subsequently agreed to move there or, as we shall see, perhaps wanted to move there as the wife of George Roach after their marriage in 1890. While I do not know if this Blanche Roach ever returned to Halifax as a visitor after her marriage, I do know that she died in Massachusetts in 1899, leaving motherless our second Blanche, who was born there in 1892, and a son, Robert, born in 1897. Now, we, I will move on to part two, the biographies of the two girls. So back to the chart. The first Blanche, Blanche G, and I don't know what the G stands for, was born in Halifax in 1868. And by the time of the school controversy of the early 1880s that centered on her, she was the eldest of four and by 1884, five children of Henry and Emmeline Russell. Not only was Blanche the, the eldest, she was also eight years older than her nearest sibling, a brother. Blanche attended two uh, successive schools for her primary education. The first, Zion School, the racially segregated but public school located in Zion African Methodist Episcopal Church on the southwest corner of Gottingen and Falkland, um, it's represented in this rather poor picture, I'm sorry, uh, a newspaper picture from the 30s in the 1930s. By the 1880s, the mothers of the children complained bitterly about the quality of the education of their children at this school, and several of the children of prominent Black families, Davis, Macaro, French, are known to have attended other schools in the downtown including the National School, though not with the school board's official approval. The National School, you probably know as the, uh, now the five fishermen, one of, well, I uh, guess our oldest um, wooden um, institutional building still standing aside from churches. The mothers also objected to Zion because the children were not segregated by sex. As a result of the mother's complaints and the concern of the school board that too many black children were looking for alternatives to Zion School, two sex segregated black schools offering primary education were arranged by 1877. The girls were sent to Lockman Street School, Lockman being a section of the current Barrington Street north of what is now the Cogswell Street interchange. The boys were sent to Maynard Street School located in the North End City Mission Building, corner of Maynard and Garish, now Buddy Day. Until 1888, when Lockman Street School, Lockman Street's 
school girls were also transferred to the North End City Mission. These boys shared the space, but in a separate class with a charity school that already existed in that location, a school for poor children, regardless of race or sex. And this is a picture of that mixed class. Um, it's a little earlier in the 1870s, but that is the building. At Lockman School, um, while, it, while the girls' school was still a Lockman, um, at Lockman Street School for five years, Blanche was a consistent annual prize winner. By the time she was 14, she was already, she was ready for secondary school. Unfortunately, the city's secondary schools were not ready for Blanche. Determined though the Russell family was, young Blanche was rebuffed and denied access first to Agricola Street School for Girls, which was a school located between North and May Streets, and then to Brunswick Street Girls School, which was south of St. George's Church. We can only imagine the extent of the distress this rejection had on the psyche of a 14-year-old child, a topic to which I will return. The ensuing petition of protest against her treatment signed by around 100 black men of Halifax representing some 200 families with school-aged children across the city's six wards included the signature of George Roach, a working man of a mere 17, by far the youngest partition, petitioner and Blanche's future husband. The petition complained of the black community's lack of freedom in the choice of public schools for their children and their unique experience as second class citizens with respect to education. They were dissatisfied with the two inferior schools freely available to them, that is Lockman Street and Maynard Street, because they, they alone among the population were denied access to neighborhood schools, schools near them, where, where they lived, to decent teachers, and adequate equipment and to secondary level classes. Their only alternative was to rely on their own private schools of which there were then apparently four located on Blowers, Albemarle, Brunswick and Gottingen Streets, schools about which we know nothing. The petition, which was my starting point and focus for the earlier study published in 1992, represented an important protest, but as the petitioners knew, the policy in place did not contravene the law because schools segregated by sex or race were perfectly legitimate according to the 1864 provincial legislation, which had originally established public schools. At the school board, as the school board was within its rights in allowing the principals of the two schools to turn Blanche Russell away, her parents joined forces with helpful neighbors with connections and arranged to send Blanche to the Boston area for that year of schooling. In Massachusetts, the schools had been integrated by law in 1855, a policy that lasted until they were resegregated in the 1930s. Blanche returned home in the summer, home to Halifax, that is, in the summer of 1883. Um, and Henry Russell wrote to the school board asking for her to be admitted to a local school suitable to her sex, age, and attainments. Two months passed without a decision, leaving Blanche in limbo. The delay produced a demand for a meeting with the board by the prominent white lawyer acting for the Russells, John T. Bulmer, known for both his prohibitionist and anti-racist views. Since his clients had no legal ground for a suit, Bulmer appealed to the school board on their behalf for a favorable decision as an act of justice. He argued that the provision of separate schools for Blacks was directed against our colored fellow citizens on the simple ground of color and social distinction, 
One drop of African blood, no matter how respectable and untarnished are the veins in which it flows, is sufficient in Halifax to doom the child of the honest taxpayer to what is in effect the ostracism and degradation of an inferior education. The board refer for, referred the matter to the provincial government and several prominent Halifax citizens and others in the to the province lobby provincial politicians for changes. The snail's pace with which the legislature moved to correct the problems identified by Boomer meant that Blanche missed virtually the whole school year. When she finally got the go ahead to attend Brunswick, Brunswick Street School at the end of September 1884, after the passage of amending legislation, she confronted the ire of racist parents. Her class was boycotted and 46 parents petitioned the school board for the removal of this obstacle to their daughter's education. By the end of September, the protests had petered out, and as a result of the evaluation of her academic standing, Blanche was promoted to the school principal's class, where girls, possibly with greater ambition, seemed less threatened by her presence. Admittedly, by that time, there had been plenty of shaming from across the Dominion of the racism displayed in Halifax. The unfavorable publicity included comments in the St. John Globe by Abraham B. Walker, the pioneer black lawyer in the Maritimes, who compared Nova Scotia to Texas and denounced Halifax as the wickedest city in the Dominion. Well, I would argue that Blanche's admission to high school level classes at Brunswick Street School was a major victory. Her high school experience just happened to coincide with the integration of the sexes at the Halifax County Academy, pictured here in its current day form. It was the year the two senior girls classes from Brunswick Street School were transferred to the Brick Schoolhouse on Brunswick at Sackville to create co-education. Here Blanche joined Charles Davis, who had been admitted the previous year and was the only other student of color in the first year of combined race and sex integration at the public high school level. Blanche Russell's career in high school was short. Her mother died in 1886 and any hopes Blanche had of becoming a teacher her likely aim were dashed as she quit school to care for her younger siblings. Her escape from the busy Russell household was provided by her relationship with George Roach, whom she married in 1890 in the African Baptist Church. Um, this is the, the current version, um, which is under con uh, a huge new um, uh, addition on the right. As Mrs. Roach, she resided for most of her married life in Greater Boston. Her daughter, Blanche Evelyn Adelaide, known while she was small as Blanche, was born the same year as the death of Margaret Grandison, the ex-slave matriarch of George's family. After the first Blanche's death in 1899, Blanche and her younger brother were probably cared for by Eliza Carrington, George's sister, while George moved back to Halifax to get himself established. I have to admit, I don't know whether George had kept up um, close contact with Halifax, but it's possible that in the intervening years, he may have been working on regular vessels between Halifax and Boston. The children did not immigrate officially to Nova Scotia until 1906, 
although they appear to have moved in 1905. When Blanche finally resumed her schooling, her age was reduced for the records, perhaps to give her confidence after a very disruptive period in the wake of her mother's death. This enabled her also to escape at this time of adjustment, the stress of high school entrance examinations required for youth from outside the area. <clears throat> and so she was enrolled in the second most senior class at Alexandra School. The successor to Brunswick Street School at an age of 12 instead of the real 14 and continued into the senior class in 1907-08. This slide shows um, Alexandra School on the old Brunswick Street site and you notice it's south of, of uh, St. George's Church. Blanche's three last years of public schooling, which concluded in the summer of 1911, were spent at the Halifax Academy where her mother had of course been one of the first female students. Blanche's real focus throughout her high school years was on the lesson she concurrently undertook at the Halifax Conservatory of Music. Starting in 1908-9. The conservatory in those days was shared space with and was located in the Halifax Ladies College, which um, was um, located on the corner of Barrington and Harvey streets. So quite far south on Barrington. I have no idea whether Blanche actually took her lessons there or not, but I assume so, but it's possible that they were done in private houses. Blanche's real, uh, Blanche, um, sorry, er, early on in her musical training, her talent was well recognized in the community. She was in demand for fundraising concerts organized by the black churches as an organist at weddings and a soloist at funerals and the like. As a result of an apparently encouraging environment, her own talent and the presence of other local African Nova Scotian girls who joined her by the, her third year, Blanche graduated from the piano performance and vocal teaching programs in 1916 and the vocal performance program the following year. The performance programs of course included graduation recitals one newspaper review of her singing described it as a very fine vocal recital enjoyed by a large and enthusiastic audience, the members of which indulged in continuous, continued bursts of applause. How many people knew that she was making local history? Well, her father did. And he was undoubtedly the one who honored both his daughter and her mother, her late mother, in the brief mention of the women's firsts in the Atlantic Advocate. George Roach had no difficulty making sure the recognition of the two Blanches was included because initially he was the vice president of the organization that published the paper. He had risen to prominence in the community soon after he took up permanent residence in the city, serving, for example, in 1909-10 as Master of Union Lodge of Black Masons, Freemasons, and in 1915 as a member of the committee that organized Booker T. Washington's visit to Halifax. And he's the only one of the family um, for whom I have a, a picture, um, unfortunately at least at this point. Soon after her graduation from the conservatory, Blanche secured a position in North Carolina at the Slater Industrial and State Normal School in Winston-Salem. One of the advertised attractions was the healthy location in the foothills of the mountainous area of Western North Carolina. However, Blanche did not have much 
of a chance to enjoy the surroundings. Before she finished her year of employment in the all black school, her father died suddenly in April, 1918. After she received the news, she went home briefly to mourn with her family and then returned to complete the semester and submit her resignation. Her experience of the South may have left a lasting impression of a segregated society that was divided into two, into two completely different worlds. She saw no signs at all of integration, less than in Halifax and far less than in greater Boston. Segregation was endemic. Even the Winston-Salem city directory separated the listings, listings of black and white residents. Back in Halifax, Blanche took up the unremunerative business of private piano and voice lessons. She may also have helped her stepmother, Josephine, with the family business, now mainly a grocery since no one had George's catering skills or the time to acquire them. There were other changes as well. The Roaches had to give up their abode on Maynard Street at least temporarily and moved to a flat above the shop on Garish until they returned to the former Maynard Street house in the mid-1920s. The post-war period saw both Blanche and Josephine gradually leave the Anglican Church as they gravitated towards Zion uh, Church. Zion provided Blanche with a number of opportunities. She became the church's choir director. She seems to have been able to use the church's vestry as a teaching and recital space for her own music students, at least in the short term. And she met her future husband there. Morris Werner Davis. So we're now on this pink, pink, no, I guess it's peachy color um, level. When they married in 1919, he was described as one of the most popular, popular young men in the city, a favorite descriptor for grooms. Nothing special about that. He was well known to Blanche's brother, Robert, who like Morris made his living as a railway porter. After her marriage, Blanche continued with her teaching, at least briefly. Her participation in musical events in both the black churches and added child rearing to her agenda. Her three children, Cortland, George and Verna, were born in the 1920s. Blanche and Morris spent the rest of their lives in a building on Maynard Street, which comprised two joint dwellings in which Josephine and her sons lived in the South one, as the whole Roach family had done before. And they, um, the Davis family lived in the North one. Now for the final section of this talk where I'm going to suggest several themes that the two Blanches experience illustrate. This is new work and still tentative in its findings. The first is the importance of family stability to the achievement of what was labeled racial uplift by leaders of the black community in the early 20th century. Developments that accompanied the emergence of the black middle class. The second is the social tension, but gradual movement toward, towards improved civil rights inherent in the mix of public and private services available to citizens in the turn of the 20th century period. The third theme, is the toll in health, especially mental health, produced by the abuse that many African Nova Scotians suffered in this city, a toll suggested here by the experience of the elder Blanche. So first, family stability. Family stability for the black population of Halifax includes at least two central features. 
One is a steady occupation for the male breadwinner. The other is the ability of their parents to provide a consistent home environment for the growing family. The experiences of the three main families here, the Russells, the Roaches, and the Davises, illust clearly illustrate these two features. The first Blanche's father, Henry Russell, is listed in the city directories between 1875 and 1905 with employment as a hawker or trader or dealer in coal or coal and oil. As for George, after his permanent move to Halifax in 1905, he is listed in the directories as the proprietor of a restaurant, which for the next 13 years was usually located at Gottingen and Garish, or Buddy Day. While both Russell and Roach were self-employed, in the third generation, Morris Davis, the second Blanche's husband, was not, but rather was one of the longtime sleeping car porters employed by the Intercolonial Railway and then by the Canadian National Railway, working out of Halifax, for him employment starting in 1912 and extending until about 1943, when he was promoted to porter instructor with the CNR for several years until his retirement. The servile nature of this largely segregated railway employment may have left men of his generation without agency, self-employment involved, to say nothing of creating a more tenuous family life. But for Davis, it was a steady, reliable employment. Now to the second influence, home environment. I would argue um, that a good home envir environment can be illustrated by consistent residents in the same location over the longer term. As far as I can discern, there were no May time moves for these families, a disruption familiar every year to many renters in Halifax at least in this period. These families owned their own houses. The Russell House at 166 Maynard, where Henry lived for 35 years, see if I can do this without losing, it's here. Um, he lived there for 35 years, was passed on to his daughter, Annie, the first Blanche's younger sister, who was many times married and as many times widowed. She lived there for about 45 years after her father's death, until close to her own death in 1956. Which means it was a Russell house for at least three quarters of a century. It's the building is no longer there. It's um, now occupied that area by new buildings. The Roaches and the Davises also lived for many years on Maynard Street. For most of the 10 years before his death, George Roach and his family lived at 98 Maynard, which I've shown you. It's surrounded by blue here. Um, the two attached houses. Um, after George's death and some time on in Gary Street, his widow Josephine returned to 98 in the 1920s and she lived there until her death in 1953. Blanche Davis died at the former um, 100 uh, Maynard in 1971 after a residency of almost 50 years. On Creighton Street, 
James and Adelaide Martin, George Roach's stepfather and his mother, lived at number 176 by the mid 1870s in an area that is now mostly public housing. And in widowhood, Adelaide continued there until her death in 1903. In other words, these families were fixtures in the old North End. And both George and his mother owned additional properties in the old North End at the time of their deaths. And I should just point out, for those that, you, that don't know it, where it was, that here is the city mission, the North End City Mission Building on Garish and Maynard that I mentioned earlier. Let's see what comes next, because I'm not sure where I am. Oh yes, the houses again. That's that's the uh, Roaches and the Davises that lived in these in these houses. The second concluding theme relates to public and private services. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the availability of such services for the black population was often marginal. In the public sphere, the schools posed problems as we've seen. Significantly, other public services were often available um, across the, uh, access, for example, to the white churches, which occasionally served as the interest of black couples and their families. Uh, I would call these public services because churches occupied their locations tax-free, making them in theory available to those who paid taxes. No one seems to have objected to church hopping for sacraments and possibly other services like Sunday school for children or indeed church membership. The predominantly white churches also cooperated with the black churches. Um, white clergymen often preached in the black churches and occasionally acted as locums. Black clergymen conducted special services in white churches as they were included in such celebrations as prayer weeks. Facilities were loaned or rented such as St. Paul's Hall. Um, in St. Paul's Parish, where Zion Church, for example, held a concert in 1915. Um, between the time it was um, the National School, and then later I remember going there and taking art classes from this, the art college, um, it was St. Paul's Mission Hall. And then I guess after the art college left, it became a restaurant. Other institutions um, served as refuges and places of care. Now this is a pretty grim looking building, I admit. For those in old age without family help or servants, the city home was crucial. Called the Poor House or Poor's Asylum until 1907, when a campaign by the local council of women against the designation finally succeeded in a name change, the city home was until the late 1950s, the equivalent of today's nonprofit old age facility, as well as increasingly until its closure in 1971, a hospital for people with manageable forms of mental illness. The respectable property owning, consistently employed families in this study certainly resorted to the city home in their dotage. Blanche Senior, Senior's father, Henry Russell, died there in 1910, as did his daughter and Blanche's sister, Annie, in 1956. And so too did Morris Davis, husband of the second Blanche, whose three children achieved a uniformly successful and impressive level of upward mobility soon after their father's death in 1948. One is a federal civil servant, another as a lawyer, and the daughter as a teacher, and later in Alberta, the wife of a longtime provincial assistant deputy minister of education. Public services also extended to financial institutions. We find, for example, members of the black community like George Roach successfully seeking a mortgage from a building society. 
And with respect to legal services, we have already seen that lawyer Boomer had the best interests of the black community at heart. He may have contributed his, his services, grateful as he was for the support he had from the black community for the temperance movement. It was Boomer who pointed out the disconnect between public and private education. If you had money, you could go to university or private school, whatever your race or religion. Boomer practiced what he preached. When James R. Johnston graduated with a law degree from Dalhousie University, it was Boomer who took him into his law office and helped him launch his legal career at the turn of the 20th century. The same openness to the black community applied to other private institutions like the Halifax Conservatory of Music with its more cosmopolitan faculty that eluded the small, mind, small mindedness of the local population. And finally, in this uh, discussion of themes, trauma. The controversy in the public education sphere in the, mid in the mid 1880s focused on Blanche Russell, a huge burden for a young adolescent and surely a traumatizing experience. She had her supporters and her detractors. The former portrayed her as a paragon of virtue. She was described as a young woman, of good education, respectable parentage and undoubted morality. Her dress is neat, her habits are ladylike and her conduct, conduct unexceptionable. But she is guilty of one sin which rendered her admission to secondary school an offense in the eyes of many highly respectable parents and children in this city. She is guilty of the sin of having a skin not colored like theirs. They felt in duty bound to pour contempt upon her, to make her feel her true position and crush her, to persecute a respectable, well-bred, colored girl. Of course, not all the comments were personal. What we now call nimbyism was a major feature. For example, in response to the outrage at her treatment expressed by a number of prominent churchmen, a North End parent dismissed the South End whites as hypocrites and the North End blacks as classist. It is all very fine for clergymen of the South End to favor the admission of Negroes in white schools when they know there's no danger of their own children being obliged to be in one with them. And those parents who can afford to pay our heavy school taxes and send their children to private schools may smile and shrug their shoulders, but let them be in a position of a good many respectable North End parents and the outrage perpetrated upon them by the school commissioners would have been repudiated long ago. The letter continued, I look upon the introduction of a Negro into the Brunswick Street School as an outrage against all feelings of decency and good breeding and done by the school commissioners merely for the sake of gaining popularity. But what about caste in the Negro schools? And what is it that has caused all the trouble and made this Miss Russell intrude herself into a white school? Nothing at all but the idea that some upper crust Negroes think themselves too good to associate common Negroes and they don't hesitate to call them trash and only n-word and hence they must ape white white folks and get their children into white schools and some soft commissioners are silly enough to listen to their nonsense that of course is a long quotation the reverend robert murray editor of the presbyterian witness jumped to blanche's defense by comparing such comments to the low brutality of mean whites in virginia or south carolina Another defender claimed that the memorialists are surely overestimating the power and disposition of young Miss Russell to injure and offend their children, while one alderman aptly suggested that if the children were as bad as the parents, it would be a good thing for them to attend school with colored children. If the hostile North Enders writing letters to newspapers hid behind pseudonyms, and they did, the signatories to the petition against Blanche's admission to Brunswick Street School in 1884 could not. And so who were the 46 bigots 
who willingly signed their names to their objections. Six, six were widows. And while no excuses are appropriate, we might at least find a possible explanation for their concerns, responsible for their maturing daughters, and in several cases also economically dependent on young adult children already in the workforce, they may have felt more than the normal degree of insecurity. For the rest, however, we are sadly dealing with Mr. and Mrs. Average White Heligonian. Most of the men, and their wives also signed, had occupations reliant on customers for buying their goods, dry goods, groceries, hardware, housewares, shoes, and services, auctioneering, carpentry, metalwork, transportation. But as few of their workplaces were in the North End, they felt no ties to their black neighbors as customers or clients. Given the importance of self-interest, they knew they had nothing to lose by signing the petition. The two anomalous signatories were Charles Milius and R.A. Temple, because they might have thought of themselves above all else as model Christians. Milius, originally from Norway and a well-known sea captain, was also an assistant to the seamen's missionary when on shore. Temple, a Methodist, was one of the city's regular clergymen. While this mid-1880s episode in white hostility and psychological harm to one young schoolgirl is central to this talk, it is important to realize that objection by whites to school integration in Halifax came to the attention of the school board at least two more times, but during the second Blanche's experience this time. The first occurred when she was in school in 1908 and was known only to the school commissioners because the complaint came from one of the, uh, the school of one of the uh, staff of one of the schools um, and was, I believe, never made public. The second was promoted by the male, the male teachers club in 1929 when Blanche, Blanche's children were young. She was well aware of the controversy because the school board had the sense to consult the black community about its wishes, a confirmation at last that the black taxpayer had rights as a citizen. Still, the black opponents of segregation left nothing to chance and organized another petition. On this occasion, both Blanche and Morris Davis, as well as Blanche's stepmother, Josephine Roach, signed the successful remonstrance designed to undermine that threat to African Nova Scotians rights to equality. But in neither of these cases was one child held up as the offender, the intruder, the tool of a particular interest group, hence less impact on children. On the other hand, sorry, the comments must have made, must Sorry, the comments that were made about Blanche Russell, Blanche Russell in the 1880s, on the other hand, must have had a detrimental effect on her mental health, especially her self-confidence and her hopes for the future. I will conclude by saying that I imagine the sources allow for many more family case studies like this one, which will help us grasp the range of immense problems the Black population faced in this city and elsewhere in past generations. While such stories of racism are ugly, I find the determination of the people affected to be inspiring, though in the case of Blanche Russell, very sad. Her experience as a girl, as a girl must have broken her spirit and caused her much anguish, may have made her hate Halifax and may have contributed to her early death. Speculation, of course, because we can really never know. Thank you for your attention. Some pictured credits. And I look forward to questions or comments. Hi, thanks Judith, sorry, I had to push my cat away. <laughs> she really likes your talk apparently. Um, <laughs> That was so fascinating. Oh my goodness. I think it should be like a mini series or something that was really, really, really interesting. And you really brought the whole family um, story to life. Like I was enthralled. Um, I have a couple of questions, but obviously we'll start with anybody 
in the audience who had any questions. Uh, and you're welcome to, so you see someone's just raise your hand. You're welcome to do that. Um, you can send a message in the chat feature on Zoom to everyone if you'd like, or just to me, Sarah Hollett. Um, and if you also make yourself known, we could also have you unmute and turn your video on if you'd like to talk to Judith um, directly. So that would be that would be nice too. Um, so I think Michelle has a question. Michelle, would you like to uh, ask your question on camera? There. Um, hi, I uh, can't thank you enough for this um, presentation. I'm so excited. My heart is beating fairly quickly. I'm actually, um, I think, the great niece of um, Blanche Russell Sr. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> When I saw this talk coming up, I uh, got in touch with my cousins in Toronto, the, the couple of beach family members who are also on here. Um, so first of all, the thanks. And secondly, um, if, if you'll indulge me for a minute, I just wanted to let you know of some of the um, materials that we have still in the family um, that relate to this. <laughs> um, so I was making a few notes um, as we go along. So my great grandmother was Annie Russell, her youngest yes. sister. And um, uh, we did uh, own those houses on Maynard Street. There were two houses. Um, and I have the deed, uh, the original deed for um, Henry Russell. And, um, but as I was told the story, the houses were expropriated. I was told to build the fire station on West Street. Um, so our family moved out to the Armdale area. Um, but I do have a picture of um, Blanche um, Jr. or young Blanche. Uh, I also have um, three original paintings that she did. So she was very artistic and I have them up in my home. Uh, and uh, also um, my father was uh, the executor of the Davis, the Cortland and, and George Davis estate and so I also have the family uh, records uh, for, for them, which I think include material at least about, well, actually probably about both of the Blanches, although I have not ha gone through them in a lot of detail. Um, but uh, you've really filled in so much um, in terms of the family history that has been passed down to us. And, and so uh, this has been fantastic. Thank you. Well, thank you, Michelle. Are you in Halifax, Michelle? Yes, yes. Oh, I great, am. oh, great. Maybe you'll, connect, maybe you'll connect with me by email. I would love to. I was looking for your email the other day when I um, saw the ad for this, for this talk. So yes, absolutely. Yeah, we can connect, we can connect you. Um, Michelle, it's, maybe you want to send a message to me in the chat. I can forward an it's email. On the bottom of, it's on the bottom of, oh, the, of that first screen. I don't know whether anybody can see it. Um, okay. I'll send it well. But 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 otherwise, otherwise, Sarah, I'm sure we'll do that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's judith.fingard at gmail.com, right, Judith? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Wow, that's how did you hear about the talk? If you don't mind me asking, I'm just I'm curious how we reached you. Notices um, through the various listservs that go out. Uh, there's there's two or three that are for um, African Nova Scotians uh, out there, and so it came across a couple of those. Okay, awesome. Well, it's great that we that you're here. That's amazing. Um, mm, thank you, thank you. Yeah, that's yeah, that's really really special. Does anybody else have any questions? Shirley Tillotson looks like she has raised her hand and would probably like to ask the question. Hello, oh. Shirley. <laughs> Hi, Judith. Uh, Hello. Uh, you know, I sometimes make fun of the Nova Scotia history, who's your grandfather, but we had a really great who's your grandfather moment here just now with, uh, with Michelle. Um, so uh, I'm curious about uh, two things. Um, one, I think, is a very short answer uh, kind of answer, and that is when you were talking about, they're both about uh, the mid-1880s education fight. Uh, and in your discussion, thematic discussion at the end, you noted that the opponents of Blanche's uh, um, 
entrance into uh, uh, Brunswick Street School were pseudonymous. Uh, but I think I also heard a long quote from a supporter, and I wondered if that person had identified themselves or who, if I was right in hearing that that was a long quote. That may be a yes or no answer. My more kind of, I guess, important question was about the amending legislation that was passed to enable that integration. I mean, that that strikes me as kind of dramatic and uh, and interesting. So was it, was it an amendment to uh, the Education Act. I'm kind of just a little curious about what had to be done in order legally to uh, permit for the, that integration. Well, um, the first question um, is uh, that you asked. Uh, there certainly are um, many of the people who commented on um, Blanche's behalf during the education um, struggle or the struggle for her to get into school were clergymen. Okay. And and they and they were prominent South End clergymen. And okay. they identif and they identified themselves. All right. Um and um and who knows, you know, um, um it's possible that some of the um angry uh, opponents in the North End um were also people who signed the uh, petition. But of course I don't I don't right. know I don't no. know that. Because no. they they certainly were anonymous. Yeah. Yeah, I was curious about the supporters, and so uh, thanks. Uh, and uh, what about that legislation? Well, uh, the, the legislation thing? enabled um, children to attend neighborhood schools. Okay. Um, so, I mean, that's quite interesting because it, it meant that in areas like Halifax, they could go to a school that was mixed, whereas in in um, in sort of totally black communities, they tended to be in schools that were dominated, um, who were, were essentially segregated, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and um, so it was It was an amendment, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it was an amendment that said, uh, you can come from somewhere, you, you, you can go to a local school, or was it an amendment that said you have to go to a local school? I'm oh, no, no, um, it had a, the amendment had a, um, a special um, clause for Halifax, <laughs> okay. It, no, there was a, sorry, now that I think of it, it's a special cause for Halifax allowing children to go to a, um, a neighborhood school. Okay, all right. Yeah, um, and um, people were worried about that initially. I think it remained, I don't think they got rid of it, but it didn't really mean very much after this because um, once the um, high school became integrated, yeah. It was pretty hard to stop integration of schools anyhow. Right, right. Okay, interesting. Although, although, yeah. although I have to admit that I didn't have time to check this. I'm sure I knew at one time that, um, you know, when you to find out about people going, children going to school, you have to, of course, look at the school registers. And I can't now swear that when they integrated the, the high school, that in fact the girls were in integrated classes with the boys. They were in the same building, but I'm not absolutely yeah. certain because yeah. it's at that period that where where um, certainly children of that age group they like to keep them apart. Right, right. Um, but they were, and and I don't even know that they built an annex on the back of the of the high school, and it may have been that the girls' classes they had girls' classes in there. So so that's a sort of weakness, I think, in the uh, whole business about um, sex integration in the high school. And I, I'll have to, I probably have to go to the, no, well, at least go back to the, the school board minutes, maybe even the, the registers to find out. Yeah. No, I'm uh, sorry, that was an omission on my part. Mm. Uh, but an amazing uh, quantity and quality of research, as always, in uh, <laughs> digging up all those cool facts. Thank you so much. Thanks, Shirley. Um, Melissa has a question, and she, she looks like she's probably going to want to ask it uh, on camera. Hi, Melissa. Hi. Hi, are you? Professor Vingard, I'm a very big fan of your work, um, and I really enjoyed your presentation today. Um, my questions are really about, um, well, the reason I really enjoyed your presentation is that most of the what I know about Black women's experience in Nova Scotia comes from uh, Bernice Moreau's uh, Black Women and the Color Contusion piece. So this was really interesting to see how different experiences of education and integration have impacted Black women. Because as far as I know, 
Um, Bernice Moreau was, has been the only thing that I've read about it. So I really enjoyed your contribution. Good. Um, my question is really about your analytical approach. It came across at some points um, that the violence that you're reading in, in these records and these experiences was from the very overt violence of people opposing integration. But I'm wondering if you plan to do something with the violence of the racial uplift ideology, the idea that respectability and well-breadness makes black people somehow then acceptable as an exception to what their racial designation should make them. Um, because I really do think, um, especially thinking about the different types of methodological and analytical pushes over the past, mm, I'd say 10 years or so, um, Brittany C. Cooper, Beyond Respectability, uh, people really questioning the validity of respectability politics in respect to Black women. Um, so I'm wondering if this is something that you're willing to or interested in engaging in your work. Well, I did a little bit on that. You know that the, the, the paper on race and respectability, do you? Yeah. Um, and I mean, that's, that's quite, that deals with a quite early period, I know. Um, um, to get into the um, period of, um, you know, where that, where that was almost a, something that, that uh, well, that was being talked about by, by Black people themselves, racial uplift and so on. Um, I guess I'd like to, if I don't think I'll be able to do it, but what I would do, what I would approach it through um, a particular uh, individual in Halifax, um, who's probably well known to people who know more about uh, the, the, um, 20th, the post First World War period, and that's uh, Beresford Husbands, because he's the one that starts the Universal Neighborhood, you know, Improvement Society, and he really gets involved in black sports and um, um, and a whole range of. He gets into all sorts of problems and difficulties too. So that um, while I no doubt he's trying to be respectable, there's there's court cases and. I mean, I mean, that doesn't answer your question particularly, but I think it would take us into the material that we need to look at to deal with that question. But I don't, I think, I think I'm, too, I'm too old to do it. If you'd like to do it, go ahead. No, no, <laughs> I don't think that's the case at all. No, um, no. I've always enjoyed your, your work. Um, I think maybe what, maybe I misarticulated my question is that, is there a way to see violence in the actual respectability discourse that someone well-bred and respectable should thus be allowed into schools. It's almost as if, if we read respectability politics as yeah. this is yeah. what makes black people allowed in spaces, there's violence in that. There's violence in someone saying, you know, you're just trying to be an uppity black person, but there's also violence in saying, well, now you're the anomaly. You're well yeah. therefore yeah. now you are allowed. As it's it's the it's the stereotypical assumption right. that black people are inherently depraved. That is the underlying premise of well-bred and respectable to, as a, as an allowance. So I'm just wondering, and you may not, and you may, well, um, but it's a different way to approach seeing right. that in kind of a multilateral way. Um. Hard to, hard to say, I think, in this case. I mean, there's no doubt um, um, the tension between, you know, how this affects the people that can allow Blacks to do things, I'm not sure, but there certainly is, is a tension, I think, between um, the Black population and, um, and some of the people who um, are not able to own houses and, um, you know, and have steady jobs and that sort of thing. So, I mean, there's a class issue there within the, within the, um, the community itself, I'm sure. Um, the extent to which whites would therefore think that some people might be uh, allowed and some not, um, I think it comes out to some extent in this 1880s um, uh, um, narrative. I think it does, yes. Um, it's just that um, I think the neighborhood at this time in, in North End is in, in flux. And I th think that's having quite an impact on um, the population that's resident there. Um, e e unlike in the more recent period where one would think of that neighborhood as being 
you know, um, a, a black neighborhood. I think it started off more as a white neighborhood and then blacks moved in. That perhaps doesn't help greatly. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure whether the material I have would lend itself to that kind of analysis. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Thanks, Melissa. Um, we, John Reed just uh, raised his hand, but I have just one quick question that came through in the chat first, John, if you don't mind. Um, Peggy was wondering uh, if, and I don't know this school, but probably you do, Judith. Uh, did Walter Bromley's Acadian School have a bearing on the schools that you've mentioned? Well, um, I have a, I've, I wrote a lot about Walter Bromley back in the 70s and 80s, um, uh, 70s, I guess it was. Um, and um, um, I mean, he claimed certainly that um, Black sat in his school like everybody else and were just as, as able. I mean, there wasn't any, he didn't seem to be racist. Uh, and that's uh, a very early period. I mean, he was only in Nova Scotia between about mm, at, uh, the war of you know, 1812, I don't think it's quite that early, in 1825, really early. Um, and, and, and both, he, he would say, you know, both sat in his classroom, side by side. So I suppose um, there is a, 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 well, there's a tradition of, of um, segregation. I'm not sure exactly. Yeah, well, there's a tradition of segregation. There's also a tradition of integration. And I'm not sure whether to blame that on, for example, there were two schools for, for, for um, before, this is long before public schools, there were two schools in Halifax in that period. Um, I mean, one was, Bromley's Acadian School, and then there was the Anglican uh, National School, and they both had this operated on the same principles with the children exactly, you know, demonstrated and, and taught the children. Um, so senior children taught ch other children. Um, and I'm not sure whether the National School embraced uh, integration to the same extent that the Acadian School does. And I don't know whether there is enough material to answer that. Okay. So, um, so there's there's a there's a tradition there, and and certainly you find people praising Bromley well into the 1860s, 70s, who claim that you know in their they had been children in Bromley school, yeah. But you know how much that influences how people looked on um, um, education for all. I don't know. Thanks. Um, Sean Reed, did you want to ask your question now? Sure, th thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you, Judith, for a fascinating talk. And um, I, I was curious about the um, impact of uh, sort of associational culture in the uh, Creighton Maynard Street area. Um, because you, you uh, obviously the church, as you mentioned, uh, at one point you mentioned Freemasons, mm -hmm. and uh, there's also a vibrant sporting culture, particularly in the late 19th over to the early 20th century, that really is focused exactly in that neighborhood and overlaps with the, um, the Atlantic Advocate as well. <laughs> Uh, in terms of the, the people involved. So I, I guess my question is that, um, you know, it's striking how you brought out the um, strength and stability of the families that you're, you're portraying. And I'm wondering if that kind of associational culture might be uh, you know, one of the, the important supports of that strength. It certainly was in the last generation that I don't deal with. I mean, the the the, the three children sort of at the at top of that chart that uh, you know are born in the 1920s. Yes, very very important for them. Um, I know Cortland, the eldest, was very big in. Um, I probably it's probably baseball or softball, um, and um, um, and and they're. Um, and he also, and, and many of the um, porters, I think, as well, um, um, joined Union Lodge of Freemasons was disbanded in 1916, I think it was. And I'm not sure when the next lodge came along. I guess it, too, was segregated. 
Um, Union Lodge was a segregated Freemason lodge. Then one called Equity came along later and lots of people belonged to, lots of people who were also involved in sports and so on belonged to that. The, the controversy during the period I'm dealing with, so it's sort of just pre-First World War, doesn't ha seem to happen so much in sports, but in people, but in the neighborhood, people in the neighborhood trying to establish clubs. And I think that raises the whole business of whether they're selling alcohol in the clubs. And um, the, 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 I guess the um, the local authorities find always find reasons to close them down. Now I, you know, some of them get um, established to the extent that they end up, you know, in, as they have they have they're incorporated. You, you find I think one or two in, incorporated, but I can't find out anything much about them. The man I dealt with, George Roach, who's the um, restaurant keeper and so on, he seems to have been gotten in some difficulty over with with one of those clubs, um, perhaps not through any fault of his own, um, and had a sort of interruption in his career because of that. Um, but um, um, I don't really quite understand how that worked against um, the Black community, but it seems to have for a while. And then later on, there were clubs that were more um, respectable, should we say, or at least, they, at, least, at least the authorities didn't go after them. Uh, that, that may not be very helpful. I know I couldn't, none, of, none of these people mentioned cricket. I couldn't find any mention of cricket. But, I, I, and so I wondered whether in fact, um, the, the West Indians um, introduced it or whether in fact, because the British military were still around, they occupied whatever space there was for cricket. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the, uh, there, there was a, a cricket club fairly continuously that was, um, where as far as I can tell, the, the players were either on Creighton Street or Maynard Street. Oh, uh -huh. And uh -huh. um, so it just struck me that it, it's, it sort of meshes very well with, uh, with uh, what you're discussing here. Oh, yeah. that's, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. I'd be interested to know some of those names. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you? Oh, sure. have oh. you yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll send them along for sure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, we had a question from the chat uh, come a couple minutes ago wondering if redlining was a major issue. So, Judith, I'm sure that you uh, know what the term redlining is, but maybe you could just briefly uh, you'll explain. Have to, you'll have to remind me because, um, you know, I keep hearing it and, and I knew what it was, but nothing stays yeah. in my head anymore. Yeah. So, I mean, from what I know of it, it's it kind of comes from a more of an American sort of perspective, but that financial services, mortgages would be denied to Black oh, families I, in I, certain I, neighborhoods. I, where they would draw a line around the okay. area. But, but with, with, with what you were saying about, and multiple people have mentioned the North End uh, white mostly, and then black, you know, people came in. So maybe that is like not well, quite well, what's happening, but you mentioned a few times that there was mortgages, some well, of the families. I, yeah, yeah um, and the mortgages in that, in the period I'm dealing with, still tend to be pretty private things and you know so it's an individual um and um or somebody who's building the house or whatever um a, allowing the mortgage to people so th there are lots of private mortgages um obtained um by by uh, african nova scotian residents in the north end um, i mean i find that difficult to deal with going through deeds and looking at all that stuff but i mean i do have lists of for a much wider, for the old study I did years ago for the hundred men that did the first petition, I mean, I've got lots of evidence of, of deeds they had for properties. Um, I, I mean, which they acquired through mortgages, but they were almost entirely private mortgages. And I think some of them were, were what you might call mortgages being um, um, charitable mortgages. I mean, I know that's a terrible ter term, but um, you find some of the well-known um, uh, humanitarian types in, in, south, in the South End uh, uh, providing mortgages, maybe not just for black people, but you know, for people who, who, who need them and can't find them elsewhere. Now that, I'm saying that, and it probably needs to be qualified, um, that whole business of vote mortgages um, really need study, but it's so complicated. We'd have to put Shirley Tillotson on or something like that. 
<laughs> taxes and mortgages. <laughs> Surely. So, so I don't. I haven't run across. I mean, I mean, uh, not, one could probably find. Um, um, oh well, let's let me think. The only thing I discovered recently that was something new that interested me. I I don't know whether any of you watched the talk on. Um, that was done that lost heritage trust talk, which was on the that neighborhood um, and the Harris builders, the Harris street people who many generations who, who built houses there. Well, I noticed that one of my people who was objecting to um, uh, the school um, integration was one of those Harris's. <laughs> um, so, you know, and, and he lived in the neighborhood. And um, so that tends to suggest there might've been some hostility. Um, by the local, um, I mean, might have been the kind of hostility that could turn into denying people financial support. But another thing's really interesting. When, when George Roach died, his will indicated he had another property. I can't remember where it was, King's Place or somewhere like that. I know, I, I, I knew, but I'm not sure. And it had a building on, I guess, but he expected his wife to have that building torn down and to build something else and he explicitly said it was to be they were to be rented it was going to be a rental building um and and the units were to be rented to respectable blacks only and by mm -hmm. that he meant he didn't want any whites i think in it and, you know he was building he was wanted to build some segregated housing for for um african nova scotians yeah Interesting. Do you know if that happened or if was it just? Mm, well, I doubt it. I mean, I mean, one would have to trace, you know, what happened to the properties uh, uh, and, and so on. And it could be done. I, I somehow doubt it, but I don't I don't know for sure. Interesting. Um, Someone has got a lot of research uh, avenues to go down. Uh, Paul, did you want to ask your question on camera? Good evening, Hello. Judith. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. It was uh, meticulous as usual, going into the new detail about the, uh, the two uh, interrelated stories. Um, I recall David, um, Alex, David um, uh, Sutherland gave a paper in 2017, and I think you contributed to it. It was uh, similar. It was uh, race prejudice, unfortunately, dies hard. And it dealt with the other end of this. It, um, you're talking about the initial attempts to try to get the um, school integrated, but um, it looks to me like just going back, just flipping through this, this article again, it looks like in um, 1916, there was an attempt to resegregate um, the schools after a period from 1885 to 1916. And that the superintendent, Alexander McKay, actually favored um, uh, segregated schools and tried to turn it back. And then the articles talks about um, 1929 and a real effort to try to resegregate the schools. So is that what you're getting at when you, you know, you quoted the uh, statement that said that as far as racist attitudes and racial uh, segregation was concerned, Halifax might have been, quote, the wickedest city in the Dominion. By well, the way, no, that that all re that all relates it? to the first one, but it but the 1929 one is is the last one I mentioned about um, um, the oh. attempt um, by these ma the males the male teachers club to re to um, re uh, to um, segregate. It's 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 always Joseph Howe. I mean I mean that the attempt in um, 1908 was at Joseph Howe, and the attempt in 1929 was Joseph Howe. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and this 1916. Well, I, I I don't know. I don't know that one. David, I think, argues in the in the uh, the write up that it was just the superintendent that wanted to do yeah. that. I mean, it was his idea. He it wasn't a, a movement anywhere. And uh, and and I guess somebody just told him to forget it. Yeah, he was an imperial presence to say the least. Mm -hmm. An awful lot yeah. of research on him and his impact. He was um, authoritarian. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so surprised me. So so you would you wouldn't find it surprising that he would take that uh, particular no, course. Not at no. All. no. No. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much for the presentation. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. 
Do we have any other questions? Anybody that hasn't had a chance to ask any yet? No, I have a quick question, Judith. Um, we, I think you, you've already kind of touched on it a little bit, but uh, um, so my, my family lived on Maynard Street and then in the 1960s moved white flight when people from Africville moved into the North End. So, you know, in the same neighborhood. And just like, I was thinking about that while I was looking at the pictures of Maynard Street. And I was wondering if you know of any reactions, the family or the family, you know, unit, close, large you know, relations, if when Africville was relocated and they moved into public housing in the North End, you know, it seems like there's two classes of black families, the, the ones, types of people that, that you're talking about that are fighting to get into schools and the type of people who were living in um, Africville who couldn't, you know, didn't have access to any of that. So I was just wondering at that point when you have in the same neighborhood, you have um, like up, upper class white people, but also, um, you know, respectable, like, you know, black people, um, what happens when you have people from Africville relocated forcibly into the neighborhood. Do you, do you know? I mean, I don't know. You probably maybe don't. Well, but. I don't know, but but one thing that might interest you, um, the Africville school was closed before Africville and, and those children were bused to other schools. And when that happened, three teachers lost their jobs. Um, one of them was um, the younger Jemet, who, who, I mean, the Jemets taught the school and were principal of, of the school at Africa for years and years. And he was sent to um, Bloomfield School, which no longer exists, but, you know, the buildings are still deteriorating. Um, and uh, a, a white, uh, not a white, no, a white, um, uh, an African Nova Scotian, the elder of the two women teachers, the more senior of the two women teachers, was sent to Westmount School. And the younger one was Verna, Verna Davis, uh, who was that last generation, uh, right. who had just started and had just been approved to teach in, she'd done her um, probationary year at Africville and was approved to go into um, another school. And she didn't get a job right away. I mean, it was quite clearly she was not being given any priority and other people were hopping over her. I could tell that from the school board minutes. But she did, within about a year of Africville pupils being relocated, she got a job, but guess where? Mulgrave Park School. Okay. So the family, the family would have been had connections to people in Africville then where she was a, a teacher there like they know oh, or was it oh yeah yeah she, she was a yeah. teacher there for a short time yeah yeah but um but you know this goes back to the question that uh, somebody asked about you know sort of class um the um in the period that we're dealing with I was dealing with here um downtown old you know old north end um African um, Nova Scotians um really looked on Africville as a mission field and they sent, you know, some of the their their prominent um, uh, laymen from uh, Cornwallis, uh, what was then Cornwallis Street Church, but you know the the African Baptist Church, out to teach Sunday school at Africville, and you know to tell them to straighten them up, if you want to right. put it that way. Yeah. So you know, it was uh, there. There were certainly um, there was certainly no particularly good close relationships that I could see between the old North End and Africville in this period I'm dealing with, hmm. except to, you know, um, to uh, try and help those poor people out. Right. You know, the attitude being uh, from downtown, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Judith. Um, if no one else has any other questions, um, I don't know if Lois uh, wants to send us off, but I will just mention um, that our next lecture, which will be in January on January 19th. Lois, is that right? <laughs> I believe it is, January yes. 19th. Yeah. I looked at uh, the calendar. Yeah, I should have looked at the calendar. Yes, Wednesday, January 19th, 2022, which may be in person or it may not be, we'll see. Um, but our presenter is going to be Megan Hudak and she is going to be talking about Silver Sands Beach in Cow Bay. So the title, tentative title is Cow Bay's Ocean Playground, the Shifting Landscape of Silver Sands Beach, 1860s to Present. 
So that will be a nice reprieve from what will surely be cold <laughs> at that time. Um, yeah, so we'll see everybody back here uh, in the new year. Thank you, Sarah.